Professor Yotaro Arita from the University of T Tokyo and the Riken Center for Emergent Matter Science. And he will talk about Vanier-based ab initio methods for correlated materials. So thanks a lot, Professor Arita, for accepting our invitations, and the floor is yours. OK, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity. And uh, I'm very sorry that uh, I cannot uh, join this school and uh, meeting next week in person in Trieste uh, due to the problem of COVID-19. But uh, in the next occasion, uh, I'd like to uh, join uh, the school or meeting uh, in person. OK, so uh, today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what we can do uh, using 190 uh, in the calculation uh, for correlated materials uh, such as uh, transition metal oxides or heavy fermion materials or uh, some organic materials and so on. So uh, my name is uh, Ryotaro Arita uh, from Research Center for Advanced Science and Technology, RCAST, University of Tokyo, and uh, Riken Sems, uh, Center for Emergent Matter Science. Okay, so, <clears throat> so when we study uh, correlated materials uh, using from first principles, I mean, uh, using ab initio calculation, uh, we quite often uh, take uh, the following procedure, namely, so we first perform uh, DFT calculation using uh, LDA or D GGA and so on, and uh, which are of course material specific and uh, uh, free from any adjustable or empirical parameters of initial. And uh, so we determine the electronic structure uh, in the large energy scales. So then uh, in the next step, we extract uh, low energy states around the film level and uh, construct a modular Hamiltonian uh, with fewer degrees of freedom, like a Hubbard model or a periodic or Anderson model or a Kondo lattice or a Heisenberg model or a Kitai model and so on and so on. And uh, for this effective modular Hamiltonian, so we can perform a systematic or more accurate uh, many body calculations. And uh, so, <clears throat> so there are two steps. So first we derive an effect model and then analyze that model. And uh, for this uh, the second part, uh, we can consider many uh, types of uh, method. And uh, yeah, dynamical mean field theory is one of the such a uh, method, and uh, uh, that part will be discussed uh, by us feedback in the next lecture. So uh, in this, my talk, uh, I'm going to mainly focus on the first step. So how to derive an effective low energy model uh, from first principles. And uh, when we construct such an effective low energy model, uh, usually it is convenient to construct one year functions uh, which are localized in real space. Because uh, if we look at the uh, model Hamiltonian, usually uh, both one body part and interaction part, so they are short range in the real space. Uh, for example, in the case of Hubbard model, uh, the most important parameter is usually transfer hopping between nearest neighbor sites. And if we look at the correlation part, 
the Hubbard Newton. So here the electron feels a Coulomb repulsion, repulsive interaction uh, when both up spin and down spin occupy the same site. So uh, the interaction is short range. So when we uh, analyze in such a model Hamiltonian, so the basis is, so it is more convenient uh, use the basis uh, which are localized in real space. So one year function is very convenient. But on the other hand, uh, usually uh, in DFT uh, calculation, uh, we use a block wave function which are localized in momentum space. So we need to uh, change the basis from block to one year. And uh, so uh, in this step, uh, one year 90 is a very convenient tool. And uh, many people uh, use it one year uh, 90 uh, to construct uh, effective low energy model. And uh, so this is a brief outline of my talk today. So there are three parts. And in the first part, uh, I mainly uh, focus on electronic uh, low energy model. Especially, I'm going to discuss how to uh, construct a uh, multi orbital Hubbard model uh, from first principle. And uh, I will introduce uh, the constrained random phase approximation method, uh, which are used to evaluate the values of uh, Hubbard U interaction parameter, Kuro interaction parameter. And I'm going to uh, show some application, uh, typical application, uh, two, two examples, uh, two uh, unconventional superconductors. And one is iron-based superconductors, and uh, the second one is a nickel superconductor. And then in the second part, uh, I'd like to discuss how to construct an effective low energy spin model. Uh, and then uh, here I will introduce uh, the so-called local force method or Liechtenstein method to evaluate the size of exchange coupling J. And then uh, in this part, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, applications application to elemental iron, cobalt, and nickel, and a bit more complex materials, uh, gadolinium-based uh, scamium compound, F electron systems. And in the third part, I want to briefly uh, introduce uh, or discuss what, what we can uh, do for uh, the system with disorder or alloy systems with coherent potential approximation uh, using one in IP. So in this part, I'm going to show application to iron-based uh, transition metal alloy. And these are uh, references of uh, my talk today. And so those who are interested in uh, technical details, uh, please check uh, these papers and actually uh, the key players in these works are uh, joining this uh, school or uh, developed meeting next week. Uh, so you use Kenomura. So he is going to uh, give a lecture on uh, symmetry adapted one year function on Friday, May 20th. And uh, Takashi Koretsune, so he is uh, going to tell tell us about the construction of a maximally localized value function using crystal symmetry uh, next week, next Wednesday. So uh, he's going to show us that uh, the size of uh, MMN file in one year 90. So the, the size of MMN file uh, is dramatically reduced uh, using his technique. Now, and uh, I would like to also uh, introduce uh, one more young colleague Takuya Nomoto, uh, he developed a method uh, of uh, Liechtenstein formula uh, using 1 in 90. Okay, 
So, uh, let me start with the first part, uh, how to derive an electronic uh, low energy model uh, using only uh, taking a, a typical representative example. So first example is iron-based superconductor. And uh, maybe uh, many of you know very well about iron-based superconductors, but uh, uh, it was discovered uh, by Kamihara and others, the group of uh, Professor Hideo Hosono uh, in Tokyo Institute of Technology in 2008. So uh, this is the crystal structure of uh, lanthanum iron oxyarsenide. And uh, so in, in this paper, so this group reported that uh, if they introduce dope fluorine and, and the, the lanthanum iron oxyarsenide, and then uh, they observe a drop in the resistivity. And uh, so they also observe the Meissner effect in the measurement of susceptibility. And uh, so this is the phase diagram and temperature and the uh, number of carriers. And uh, so the mother compound is an uh, antiferromagnetic metal. And very close to the antiferromagnetic phase, there is a superconducting phase. And the uh, maximum TC is 26 Kelvin. And one interesting feature of uh, iron-based superconductor is that uh, uh, has a many, there are many families. So one one type like iron selenide or iron telluride, a one 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 system lithium iron arsenide, a one two two uh, strontium iron arsenide, a barium one two two system, and so on and a double 11 system, 1111 system, uh, lanthanum iron oxyarsenide and so on. And uh, so especially for this uh, family, so on February 23rd on 2008, so Hosono's group reported superconductivity in this material. And uh, in two, two months, so it, turn out that uh, if we replace uh, lanthanum with other rare earth element, then TC enhances dramatically, and the maximum TC is about 55 Kelvin. So uh, this fun, so iron-based superconductors uh, uh, shows a, a, a variety of, you know, uh, physical properties. And uh, material dependence is interesting in the system. And uh, so, so when we discuss uh, physical properties, uh, including uh, the mechanism of superconductivity in iron-based superconductors, so we need a uh, realistic and accurate uh, uh, low energy microscopic model. So uh, this is uh, the electronic structure of uh, uh, lanthanum iron oxyarsenide. And uh, if we look at this band structure, uh, we see that uh, around the film level, we have uh, 10 bands uh, originating from iron 3D orbital. So the unit cell of uh, this compound has two iron atoms. So and each iron atoms uh, has five d orbital. So in total, we have 10 band here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Mm -hmm. uh, here degenerate uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And uh, uh, below this iron 3D bands, uh, there are oxygen 2P bands or arsen 4P bands. And above iron 3D bands, 
so they are ransom for F bands and the ransom for D bands. And uh, so superconductivity is uh, in general uh, the instability of film surface. So uh, we can expect that if we have uh, a realistic model uh, which represents uh, greatly the exiting structure around the film level, and then by analyzing that microscopic model, uh, we can understand uh, the physical properties, including superconductivity. Uh, and then, uh, so it's a uh, important step uh, to construct a low energy effective model. And uh, about 15 years ago, uh, collaborating with uh, uh, Kuroki san of Nari san, so constructed an effective model for uh, iron based superconductors uh, using 1E90. So we extract uh, the iron 3D bands and the constructed 10 bands model. And uh, we also uh, unfold the brilliant zone and uh, construct the model uh, which contains only one iron atoms in the iron cell and then so it's a five band model and uh, so I think th th this is the the first as far as I know <laughs> this is the first application of 1 in 90 to iron based superconductors and uh, that the five band model uh, has been used in many theoretical calculations and uh, so I'm not going to the details of this work, uh, but uh, so if those who are interested in uh, the details, uh, please uh, check this paper. So uh, the model proposed here has been used many uh, theoretical works and uh, it's been cited uh, more than 1000 times. Okay, so uh, using 1 in 90, so the one body part of the Hamiltonian, uh, is being constructed. And so the next question uh, is how large is Hubbard U? And uh, in fact, uh, the Hubbard model is a very uh, basic model in condensed matter physics, and uh, there are many explanations in textbooks, such as uh, Ashcroft Mami and so on. But usually, uh, we do not discuss how large is U in real materials. And, uh, but uh, actually, we can evaluate uh, the size of uh, these interaction parameters in the Hamiltonian from first principles. Uh, and there are several methods, uh, but uh, uh, the constrained random phase approximation uh, formulated by uh, Ale and others uh, in 2004, uh, this method is uh, one of the most uh, uh, widely used method to estimate the, the value of Hubbard U in the effective model. And uh, the, the basic idea of uh, constrained random phase approximation uh, is following. So we uh, consider to uh, calculate the screened color interaction in the framework of random phase approximation. So, uh, so what we need is the effective Coulomb interaction between iron 3D bands. So this is the band structure of ransom iron oxy arsenide. And uh, so when we um, uh, consider the size of how about you between iron 3D bands, we have to consider the screening effect screening by other electrons such as RCM4P, oxygen 2 p and so on. So there is a screen, uh, screen effect of screening. And uh, so, so in real materials, iron 3D electrons uh, do not uh, interact with each other directly. So they are always there is a screen. And uh, so when so when we consider the effective U 
uh, we need to consider the screening effect. But here, uh, what we uh, have to note is that uh, we should not include the screening by iron 3D electrons. So the, this is because, so the screening by iron 3D electrons uh, should be considered when we solve the effect model. So when we derive an effect model, uh, we should not double count the effect of the screening by iron 3D electrons. And uh, so in fact, uh, in the random phase approximation, actually we can easily exclude the effect of uh, the screening uh, by uh, iron 3D electrons. Namely, so uh, in the random phase approximation, uh, we consider this uh, polarizability and that this polarizability uh, there are four types of transitions, namely transitions uh, from occupied state, so namely arsen 4 p states, for example, to target states, iron 3D states, and uh, target states to virtual states, uh, for example, Lansalam 4D and so on, and uh, occupied to virtual, and uh, transition among and target electrons. So there are four types of transitions, but we can easily decompose into uh, two, two terms. Uh, one, one is a transition and between uh, target electrons, iron 3D electrons, and uh, the rest of chi. And uh, if we calculate W effective, using this chi r, chi rest. And then uh, this W effect, an interesting but namely, so if we calculate this, this W, uh, yeah, yeah, we can calculate, obtain this full screen W using this W effective and this polarizability in, in this target space. So this equality identity equation uh, indicates that. So this W effective uh, can be regarded as a Hubbard U in this, this target space. So if we calculate the matrix element of W effective uh, using the one-year function, and then uh, we can estimate Hubbard U or uh, Hund coupling J on, or other interaction parameters for the low energy effective model. So th this is the basic idea of constrained uh, random phase approximations. And uh, so in this paper about 10 years ago, so <coughs> uh, we is <coughs> Sorry. we performed a systematic calculation of a uh, uh, constrained RPA calculation for a variety of uh, uh, iron-based superconductors. And uh, we found that there is a positive correlation between anion height and uh, the ratio between Hubbard U and the nearest neighbor transfer hopping. So anion height means uh, the the distance between an ion and uh, the layer of iron. And uh, when uh, this anion height uh, becomes smaller or lower, then uh, the hybridization between iron 3D and uh, an ion, uh, for example, RSN4P, uh, becomes stronger. And then the size of one function becomes larger. And then uh, the system tends to be uh, weakly correlated. Now, for example, uh, iron phosphide, uh, the TC is quite low, and uh, we see that the uh, correlation is quite uh, weak. So uh, 
but the details of the material dependence of this parameter uh, you know, those who are interested in it, please uh, check this uh, paper. And uh, so next, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, another application, application to nickel superconductor. And uh, so uh, quite recently, uh, the group of uh, Harold Pan uh, from Stanford University, so they reported in paper that uh, starting with uh, the, the perovskite phase uh, using the top tactic, uh, reduction approach, uh, they succeeded in uh, synthesizing uh, infinite layer phase of uh, neodymium nickel oxide. And uh, they found that uh, if they introduce strontium in the system, and then uh, a superconducting transition occurs. And then this is uh, the phase diagram. So we see that there is a uh, superconducting phase. So the, these are report from an independent group. And uh, this material is now uh, studied very uh, extensively. And uh, since time is limited, so I cannot go into the details, but uh, recently, uh, Yusuke and I, uh, I wrote a review paper on this material. So uh, if you are interested in please, uh, also check this uh, review paper. And uh, so uh, here it is uh, interesting to compare a nickel superconductor and a high TC cuplet superconductor. So uh, there's one common feature between these, uh, these uh, uh, transition metal oxides, namely, uh, so uh, nickel 3D dx minus y square or kappa dx minus y square so band uh, makes a very large film surface and uh, so th this is a very two dimension so th this uh, band can be a model by a tight band model uh, on a square lattice this is a common feature you can see by comparing these two uh, band structure. And there are also some differences, namely, uh, if we look at the energy difference between nickel 3D and oxygen 2P. So the uh, energy difference is large in the case of nickel oxide, uh, but here it is small. So uh, cuplet is uh, the so-called charge transfer type of the insulator. Uh, but uh, nickel oxide uh, side in the regime of mot haba uh, regime. And uh, so the energy difference between the, the energy the uh, states in the block layer, in the case of neodymium and the nickel 3D, so that energy difference is small in the case of nickel 8, but in the case of a cuplet, uh, and the energy levels of block layer and kappa. So in this case, calcium and kappa 3D is large. So we do not see uh, around the film level, we do not see uh, the, the state from block layer in the case of calcium cuplet, but uh, in the case of uh, nickel superconductors, uh, the states, the neodymium block layer, uh, we see that small electron pocket here, uh, which comes from the broccoli. And uh, so, uh, quite recently, uh, using 190, uh, Yusuke uh, constructed an effective low energy model. And uh, he found that uh, if we introduce, consider three orbitals, namely uh, nickel 3D X minus Y square or neodymium 5D Z square or in interstitial S states here. So uh, basically uh, the low energy uh, energy dispersion in DFT calculation uh, can be reproduced. 
And uh, then uh, the next interesting question is whether this uh, two dimensional states uh, originated from 3dx minus y square uh, is uh, strongly correlated or not. So in the case of Q plate, of course, it is strongly correlated and the system is not a motor insulator. And uh, that strong correlation, uh, we think that uh, it's a very important uh, factor to understand uh, the origin of high-tc superconductivity. And the uh, interesting question here is whether the, the, how strongly this 3D x minus y square correlated with each other. And USK uh, performed um, CRPA calculation uh, for this uh, compound. And uh, he found, so he constructed a single orbital Hubbard model uh, for this band. And he found that uh, the ratio uh, between U and T is as large as seven. So the, this number is a bit smaller than uh, those of cuprates, uh, but still it's quite large. So it's as so U is as large as the bandwidth, right? So we can say that the system is strongly correlated, and uh, the situation uh, the nickelate is quite uh, similar uh, to that of uh, cuprates. So uh, I'm not going to details, uh, but uh, we uh, discuss a uh, more detailed electronic structure uh, in this paper. So uh, those who are interested in the details, please check uh, this paper also. So uh, this model has been used by many theoretical calculations and uh, cited almost 100 times. And uh, so there are so many theoretical studies for this nickel superconductors, but uh, here uh, let me advertise uh, calculation by my young colleague, uh, Motoharu Kitatani, in this paper. So uh, he recently performed uh, D gamma A calculation. So D gamma A is a uh, uh, gamma means uh, the vertex collection and uh, so it's a, one of the extension of the dynamical uh, mean field theory, which will be discussed in the next lecture. And uh, so Motoharu, uh, together with the people in the group of Kasten Health in Vienna, so he performed a uh, calculation uh, with the gamma A, and then he obtained the phase diagram. And so actually, he calculated this phase diagram before the experimental report. And we see that uh, there is a good agreement between theory and experiment. And uh, so regarding the uh, constraint R package to perform constraint RPA random phase approximation, uh, there are uh, several packages. And uh, one uh, one package is uh, the BASP. So if we visit the web page of BASP, uh, there is a nice tutorial so, uh, which explains how to combine 1 in 90 and uh, BASP. And uh, in this uh, page, uh, if we follow this instruction, then uh, we can calculate how about the U of uh, strontium uh, banana. Uh, the electronic structure of strontium vanadate is quite uh, simple. So there are uh, isolated three bands, uh, three T2G bands. And uh, uh, in this web page, uh, they explain how to calculate and they have a U or other interaction parameters uh, using uh, constant PA. And uh, another package to perform CRP calculation is uh, this pack, uh, which was uh, developed by Kazuma Nakamura, my old friend. And uh, Yusuke is also one of the developers of this code. And uh, using uh, this pack, uh, we can uh, calculate and how about you? 
combining with uh, Gundam Espresso or uh, TAPP, Tokyo Abunisho Program Package. So uh, those who are interested in the technical details of concerned RPA, uh, please also visit this website. Okay, so then, uh, so using CLPA or uh, derivation of type one model using 190, uh, then we we have an effective amount of the model and uh, we can determine all the parameters in Hamiltonian like a transfer hopping, on-site energy, or how about you, intra or without how about you, or inter or without how about you, or Hunt coupling J or pair hopping uh, interaction. And so once we have this effect of Hamiltonian, we can perform uh, uh, many body calculations. And uh, one, one possible approach is, of course, uh, dynamical mean field theory. And I think uh, this method will be uh, explained in more detail in the next lecture. Okay, so this is the first part. And uh, next, uh, let me move on to the second part. So how to uh, derive an effective steam model. So uh, in the effective steam model, the most important parameters is the exchange coupling, J. And uh, for the estimate or evaluation of uh, uh, exchange coupling J, uh, there is a well established method uh, proposed by Liechtenstein. And uh, so I am not going to the details or derivation of this method, but uh, I would like to introduce a very nice lecture note uh, by uh, Professor of Office uh, Mavropoulos. Uh, this lecture was given in the spring school in Uri in 2014. And uh, you, you can find this lecture note in the website. Uh, and uh, so the basic idea of this uh, Liechtenstein uh, method is to look at the change in the energy, total energy or free energy, uh, when we introduce a perturbation or rotation of uh, the direction of one or two spins in the system. So for example, in the case of ferromagnet, so uh, if we choose two sides, I and J, and uh, change the direction, see, and introduce uh, some camping seat I and seat J, and uh, look at the change in the uh, total energy, then we, we can estimate the size of J. And, uh, and this approach can be applied to an uh, electronic model like the Hubbard model. And uh, so uh, the J uh, can be uh, obtained and evaluated uh, by computing these this equations. So here G, G is a uh, Green's function. And uh, so if we have a uh, Green's function, basically we can estimate J i J. And uh, also uh, we can think about the rotating. So here we rotate two spins, but uh, we can also consider one spin. We choose one spin and rotate the direction. And, and uh, by looking at the uh, uh, change in the total energy, uh, we can have an information of uh, the summation of uh, exchange coupling. Uh, J0i, J0, J0 is the site which, for which we rotate the direction of spin. And uh, by looking at the uh, change in the energy, uh, we, we have an information of the summation of J0i. J0i means interaction between this side and this side, or this side and this side, and so on, and so on. And this quantity uh, is a, uh, important quantity when we want to have a rough estimate of transition temperature. So by mean field theory, we can derive this equation. And uh, so if we uh, have a sum of this, this J0i, uh, 
by looking at this quantity, uh, we can uh, have a rough estimate of transition temperatures, wise temperatures, near temperature, uh, chilly temperature. And uh, so, uh, so this quantity, sometimes we say the J0. To obtain J0 for the Hubble model, uh, we have to calculate this quantity. But anyway, so if we have uh, information of Green's function, uh, we have a J0 and uh, we can estimate Tc. And uh, th this method, uh, Lichtenstein's method, uh, has been used uh, together with the, so, uh, the full potential Coringa con Rostoka method, Green's function method. So uh, in the electronic structure calculation, so we, we you usually calculate energy dispersion. And the energy dispersion can be obtained, of course, by diagonalizing uh, Consham Hamiltonian. But uh, we can also obtain uh, energy dispersion by considering a scattering problem. So in this KKR method, uh, we consider the scattering problem, and we scattering problem of atomic potentials, and uh, we consider the Green's function of the system. And by looking at the poles of the Green's function, uh, we can calculate the band dispersion. And that, that is the basic idea of KKR method. And uh, in the KKR method, uh, of course, we have a Green's function. So it's quite straightforward to calculate uh, the Liechtenstein formula. So it's based on the Green's function. And uh, so th this is the uh, results of uh, uh, calculation for BCC iron. So th th this is the density of states for majority spin, and this is the density of states of minority spin. And uh, so th this blue curve uh, is uh, J0, uh, th th this quantity. Uh, as a function of Fermi energy. So uh, this curve tells us that so at the Fermi level, so I, at, when E, e equal EF, uh, the, the sign of J0 is positive. That means uh, iron is a ferromagnet. And if we dope electrons, then uh, J0 becomes larger. That means TC becomes larger. And that, so uh, the situation uh, corresponds to cobalt. The TC becomes higher. And in the experimentally, um, TC of cobalt is higher than iron. So it is consistent with experiment. And But if we dope too much electrons, then TC becomes lower. And that means uh, iron, cobalt, and then nickel. Yeah, the TC of nickel is lower than cobalt or iron. And so th this behavior is consistent with experiment. And uh, also, if we do holes, so manganese, chromium, and so on. So th these uh, transition metal tends to be antiferromagnet. So th this is also consistent with experiment. So th this curve. Uh, uh, qualitatively explains uh, why uh, chromium or uh, manganese. So these uh, tend to be antiferromagnet and the cobalt has a higher Curie temperature than iron and uh, TC of nickel is lower than iron or cobalt. And uh, so, so the, this curve uh, is usually uh, obtained by Coringa uh, Cohn, uh, Rostoka, Green's function method. But uh, it would be very nice if we can perform this type of calculation, uh, starting with, for example, plane wave basis and combination of uh, plane wave basis and 1 in 90. And uh, indeed, uh, recently, Takuya performed such a calculations. And uh, this is the result. So J0 uh, for iron and uh, cobalt and nickel. And uh, this curve uh, corresponds to uh, 
this this curve. So uh, basically, uh, we can obtain uh, the same result. And uh, so if we drop electrons and uh, then uh, Tc becomes higher, uh, but uh, if we introduce too much carriers, then or uh, the number of carriers increases, then the situation uh, corresponds to nickel and the Tc is lower than cobalt and iron. And uh, from this value, we can estimate Tc and the agreement between uh, theory and experiment uh, is uh, not so bad. And uh, so we can apply this method uh, for more complex materials, uh, namely uh, skamion materials. So skamion is uh, maybe uh, many of you know, uh, it's a uh, vortex-like uh, spin texture. So suppose there is a, a helical spin structure in y directions. And if we consider the superposition of this helical structure in three directions, uh, then uh, we obtain this type of structure. And uh, so this, this uh, spin configurations uh, can be uh, characterized uh, by a winding number. Uh, so uh, characterized by a topological number. So uh, the scamio is quite a robust object. And uh, so uh, especially small scamio uh, attracting broad interest because uh, it is robust and uh, we can think about making some efficient high density spintronics devices if lambda is small enough. And uh, so, there are two types of ascamium materials. Uh, one one uh, is a system compound having uh, that doesn't have uh, central, uh, that is non central symmetry, so doesn't have inversion symmetry. So, in these uh, magnets, uh, so of course, uh, due to the absence of uh, uh, inversion symmetry, so Jaroszynski Moria interaction is finite. And uh, so this uh, jaroszynski moria interaction uh, makes uh, this Hecker structure. And uh, so the size of uh, this modulation so is uh, proportional to the ratio between exchange coupling and uh, jaroszynski moria interaction. So when the jaroszynski moria interaction is large, then uh, the size of scamion becomes uh, small. And more recently, uh, uh, there are se several theoretical studies uh, which propose that uh, even in, in uh, central symmetric systems, uh, due to frustration or RKKY type interaction or four spin type interactions, uh, scamium can appear. And uh, indeed, uh, recently, uh, system with inversion symmetry uh, shows a, a small scamion. So gadolinium type, uh, gadolinium based compound, gadolinium to palladium silicon 3 or gadolinium 3 ruthenium 4 aluminum 12 or gadolinium ruthenium to silicon 2. So they consist triangular lattice, kagome lattice or square lattice. And here we should note that uh, the size of scamion is very small, 2.4 nanometers, 2.8 nanometers, or 1.8 nanometers. So 10 times smaller than, more than 10 times smaller than these uh, scamion. And uh, so, uh, for, for example, in the case of gadolinium ruthenium to silicon 2. So th th this is a crystal structure. It's the same as uh, the one to two type uh, uh, iron based superconductors. So here, so we, we have no frustrations. Um, so ruthenium or gadolinium makes a uh, square lattice, and the system has an inversion symmetry. And that uh, this is a phase diagram. And uh, so uh, the nail temperature of this system is uh, 46 Kelvin. 
and it has a helical spin structure and single Q structure in at, at the zero magnetic field. But if we apply the external magnetic field, uh, then uh, in this region, double uh, Q structure, uh, that's namely scamion, appears. So there, there is a scamion phase at uh, uh, 20 Kelvin and two Tesla. And uh, so uh, the size of Q is about 0.22. And uh, the, the question here is whether we can reproduce this Q and this Tn uh, by a Lichtenstein method. And uh, recently, Takuya uh, performed such a uh, uh, study of this problem using 1 NIT. So oh, in this study, uh, Starting with uh, this case, uh, I think win 2 k as far as I remember. So starting with win 2 k calculation, uh, he used 190 and uh, constructed uh, 56 orbital models. Uh, 56 means uh, includes a gadolinium 5D, gadolinium 4F, lucidium 4D, and silicon 3P. So he constructed this model. And the constructed of uh, Green's function and uh, uh, using the Lichtenstein method, he uh, estimated uh, uh, this uh, exchange coupling. And he uh, calculated uh, spin structure factor. And uh, so he found that uh, this guy has a peak at Q equal 0.2. Uh, this number is quite consistent with uh, this experimental observation. And the nail temperature, 46 Kelvin. So yeah, this number is also, uh, so th this is quite simple uh, mean field calculation, but uh, uh, J0, uh, we see that J0 gives a very nice estimate of the experimental TC. So, uh, the results of Richten sign um, calculation is consistent with the experiment. And uh, so uh, the, the, this uh, code has been also applied to uh, nickel superconductors. So Yusuke and Takuya together with Motoaki Hirayama. Uh, so they estimated the size of uh, exchange interaction J of a nickel rate. And uh, they found that uh, they, this interaction is as large as about 100 milli electron volt. It's uh, smaller than cuprates, but still it, uh, quite large. Okay, so uh, so let me finally um, briefly uh, introduce uh, the calculation of co using coherent potential approximation. Uh, with uh, 1 in 90. So uh, when uh, we studied uh, a system with disorder or alloy systems, uh, we quite often use uh, uh, the coherent potential approximation. And for the coherent potential approximation, uh, I recently found a very nice lecture by Professor Hana Teletska. Uh, in the YouTube, it's uh, just 20 minutes lecture, but uh, she nicely explains what is coherent potential approximation. And but the, the, the basic idea of this method is the following. So uh, let us consider this uh, random alloy uh, of uh, atom A and atom B. So there are two types of atomic potential in the system. And uh, the scattering is described by uh, team matrix TA and TB. So th th this is the original system. And uh, to study the electronic structure of such a uh, random alloy, so we consider a system with a fictitious atom, uh, which describes the configuration average of random alloy. And so the team matrix of this uh, fictitious atom is T tilde. And uh, um, the 
if we follow the argument by Lippmann Schwinger, then the Green's function of this system is a uh, can be obtained by this equation. So the G naught is uh, the Green's function uh, without uh, scattering. And uh, this is a uh, T matrix, G tilde. And uh, if we consider to replace uh, this fixed uh, atom with atom A, and then the Green's function becomes like this. So G tilde one minus TA minus T tilde and G tilde. And uh, similarly, you can obtain the Green's function uh, for this system. Namely, we replace the fictitious uh, atom uh, uh, with, uh, with B. And then uh, if we consider the configuration upgrade, then we obtain this original uh, system with fictitious atoms. So by so solving these equations, uh, we can determine the uh, Green's function of this system. And uh, so here, so the calculation is a bit similar to that of DMFT, uh, which will be discussed in the next lecture. So we have uh, self-energy, uh, imaginary part. And uh, so th this calculation is usually uh, uh, used together with the uh, KKR method because uh, as I mentioned in the KKR method, uh, we have the Green's function. So application of uh, KKR method uh, is quite straightforward. But uh, it will be very nice uh, if we can perform uh, this CRPA calculation uh, by combining uh, plane wave basis and uh, mm, one in 90. And uh, so recently, uh, a student of Takashi Koretsune, Ito Kun, uh, performed together with the group people in the group of Professor Ebert. Uh, so he performed such a calculation. So th th this is a uh, comparison between the one year based CPA and the KKR. So f first, uh, let, let us com compare the pu pure uh, copper and pure iron. So and uh, so th this is a pure system, and uh, this is a uh, uh, alloy system. So uh, iron 0.6, copper 0.4. So this is the results of KKR CPA, and this is a uh, 1 in 90 CPA, and we obtain basically the same result. And uh, with uh, this method, we can also uh, obtain the so-called slit polling curve. Uh, here, uh, the size of magnetic moment uh, is uh, calculated as a function of the number of electron per atom. So we start with iron, and uh, we consider the alloy with vanadium, cobalt, nickel, copper. So uh, we, we have the same result with the KKL CPMS. Okay. okay. So uh, this is the summary of my talk today. So there are three parts. I uh, introduce uh, the uh, average derivation of the yeah, Hubbard model, and uh, I show the results for iron-based superconductors, and uh, also nickel-based uh, superconductors associated with this here. And also I discuss uh, how to derive an effective spin models uh, using Lichtenstein. Uh, formula and uh, we show the application to iron cobalt nick and scamion compounds and uh, in the third part i discuss how to perform cpa calculation uh, and uh, i showed application to iron based transition metal alloys okay so i will stop here and thank you very much for nice uh, your attention So thank you very much, Professor Ita, for the great talk. Um, we have, I think, time for a couple of quick questions. So I will start from the one that was asked online. Um, if I can find it again. Yeah. So Emmanuel Martinez asked, uh, in iron-based superconductors, do you know how important is the U parameter in comparison to Van der Waals interactions to better describe the crystal structure, interplanar distances, iron-anion distance? 
Oh, interesting question. I've never thought about that. Okay. Uh, one day about interaction. You mean the effect of one day about interaction? And how about you? How about? Oh, sorry, I don't have a good answer to this question. Mm, I'm sorry, I, I, I never thought about that. Okay, I think we have plenty of questions, so. <laughs> Thank you for the, the talk. Um, in your uh, CRPA method that you described at the beginning, um, do you have some rules on uh, uh, how to choose the target uh, uh, subspace when you have many entangled bands? Because all the system you showed, they were very, uh, you know, uh, uh, in energy, they were very uh, uh, isolated. Yeah, yeah. But in a case where you have something very entangled, do you have some rules or, or some idea how, how to most effectively yeah. choose this uh, target space? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are several approaches uh, to uh, treat such a situations. And uh, yeah, one, one easy, the easiest approach is just uh, uh, extract the information of the amplitude okay. consisting of uh, the Bernier function. Ah, maybe Yusuke Nomura has a comment. I think we have to unmute him. Hmm? Uh, ah. uh, no, no, mute on that Yeah. Well, actually, I'm not allowed to unmute by myself. So. Yeah, no, that's on purpose. Ah. <laughs> please, please, yeah. uh, you go ahead. So, yeah, actually, I have a comment for the first question from Emmanuel. I think for, for the the distance between the planes, the van der Waals interaction would be important, but the distance between the anion and the iron. The Hubbard you plays an important role because if we assume the magnetic, uh, so if we do the crystal structure optimization, assuming the magnetic solutions, then the distance between the anion and the iron layer changes from the paramagnetic solution. So it means that the distance between the iron and the anion, the, the Hubbard you play a role, play an important role, but for the distance between the planes, I think the van der Waals interaction pretty important. Mm, yeah, yeah. So the anion height uh, is the experimental value of anion height is uh, correctly reproduced when we do LSDA calculation. But uh, if we do paramagnetic LDA calculation, then as far as I remember, it is underestimated. Hmm. The anion height is, as far as we know, it's underestimated. And if we consider spin polarization, then experimental value tends to be properly reproduced. Yeah. Uh, I have a question in the first part of your talk. Um, so you calculate the effective Coulomb parameters from the Vanier functions. But uh, we know that Vanier functions can change a lot depending on how we construct them. So does that mean that your Coulomb interaction parameters also depends sensitively on the way we make Vanier functions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For example, uh, yeah. if we construct uh, effective model. Uh, so, so and if it does, my second question is, is it OK yeah. to depend on the Vanya? Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, yeah. So in this paper, we constructed a model for this target space. But uh, in that paper, we also constructed a model. I, th I think you have to B share. I think you have to share your screen again. Uh, ah, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Eh, to. Kore ka. 
Uh, sorry. Okay, uh, now we see it. So, uh, in the in this paper, so so the, this result is for model, or did this this D model, but uh, we also uh, derive a model for D and P D P model, and then uh, in the D P model, the size of one function is smaller uh, than D model. And then uh, the Hubbard U in the DP model is tend to be larger than D model. But we believe that uh, so if we properly solve the DP model, and then the uh, in ideal situation, of course, uh, the result should be the same as uh, that of the D model. Uh, sorry, let me change my question a little bit. We just focus on the D model, but even within the D model, we, the Vanier functions can change depending on which particular scheme uh, yeah, we yeah. take. Yeah, yeah. Then, uh, so I think uh, we, yeah, if the size of Vanier function changes, then uh, uh, the size, size of offsite, for example, offsite U, the value of offsite U changes. Right. And is it okay? So, um, so if we in, include uh, properly the old U, then the result should be the same. I see. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So we are a little bit late on schedule. So I think in the interest of time, we can thank again our speaker.